and the camera guy went over there and shot him and um, harvested. You harvested. Harvested. Yeah, I'm not afraid. You harvest. harvest <laughs> you harvest wheat. Uh, we're at the NFR. They've heard kill before. Right. Uh, sorry. Oh, you're good. Keep it going. <laughs> Actually, Flint posted that one time on one of my comments. He's like, "You didn't harvest that." <laughs> he said, "You harvest wheat." Live from the NFR. Make sure you hit that subscribe button, catch up on all the old episodes, and check out the latest. You're going to like it. Welcome to the Luke Branquino Show here at the Las Vegas Convention Center on the Cowboy Channel stage. If you could hear my voice, you guys come on down. We're going to have a great show today. i got some great guests. If you're watching on the Cowboy Channel Plus app... Thank you for doing that. And if you do get to Vegas, make sure you stop by. I don't know what booth number it is. I know it's the eighth performance of the national finals. So if we get a little raspy with our voice or we start to lose it, there's obvious reason why Uh, it is Vegas and we do drink a little while we're out here. The guests on my show today, I got some really good, good, well, I got some a little bit of talent here. Dakota Eldridge, two-time NFR average winner, multi-time NFR qualifier, obviously, and a stud at throwing steers down, and Eddie Prefert, the head janitorial man at Prefert. That's exactly, that's exactly right. <laughs> Just exactly joking. Right. President of Prefert. Eddie, thank you guys, and Dakota, thank you for coming on. Um, Eddie, I want to start with you because I know Dakota and I, when we first started rodeo, and our dreams were to get to the Thomas Mack for those yellow bucking shoots that are Prefert manufactured. Yes, sir. Yeah, well, you know, we, we started uh, with the NFR, doing the NFR in... Uh, Oh, 2007. So we've been coming out here for several years, bringing the shoots, bringing all the equipment, a lot of employees. And, uh, you know, it's just like every year when we come back, it's like a family reunion. Just everybody getting together and we enjoy enjoy everyone. Well, and I think the, every cowboy's dream is when they watch it on TV, you know, you see those buck and shoots. Dakota, let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, being a Nevada cowboy and getting to be in your home state and a chance at the world championship. Yeah, you know, uh, this... Uh, it's amazing to have one of the best rodeos in the world six hours from my house where I grew up. Um, you know, and actually during that slack performance the other day, I made sure I got in there and watched that opening because <clears throat> that opening, as a little kid, I remember those goosebumps and that feeling and that electricity in that arena was like, that's why I want to be in Vegas. Like that, that's why we drive the miles we do and put, you know, the time away from our family and stuff. And uh, so the other day when we had the slack, it was like, man, I want to get in there and watch that. I haven't watched it since my rookie year. I was down here. You know, we can watch it back in the tent before we go in for the grand entry. But that morning we didn't have to do the grand entry. So it was neat to just to go in there and see it and Viva Las Vegas and see the flags and and go back and relive that dream as a kid, you know, and what we chased this whole time. And and being talking about being a kid, Eddie, your family has been heavily involved for I, I, and I had to Google it because I know it's been a long time, but you, like your great grand or your granddad yeah. started the company uh, and just in, in the farming and ranching industry, it is so impressive to read on Google. If you guys have the Google machine on your phones, Google Prefert and just li- look at the story coming up to where you guys are at now today, starting in a, you know, a shop with a dirt floor. Yes, sir. And now what, uh, over 20 acres undercover, and air what, conditioned. And yeah, yeah, it's about... 30 acres under roof of 1,000 employees there in Mount Pleasant. So we, we have a lot of fun. We, we don't know any better. We just work. <laughs> well, I think for a company like that and, and having fun and keeping your employees happy, that, that goes hand in hand. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you, you know, that's just part of it. You're, you know, you, everybody uh, enjoys what they do and enjoys the lifestyle. And uh, we do, too. We have a passion for all of it. So. Well, and enjoying that with your endorsees, and obviously Dakota, one of the preferred endorsees, as I am, too. And I think you guys, as we do as contestants and ambassadors of, of companies, we go out and look for those companies that we not only use their product, even before we were endorsed by them, right. but that we have a great relationship and kind of the same goals in mind. Yeah, you know, that's, yeah, that's, that's a good point. We, we, we love having endorsees and partners that use the equipment before before we partner up with them. And we look for good people, and you guys are as good as they come. So 
Well, we appreciate you. What's neat is the junior ambassador program you guys put together because yeah. it's been going for some time, but you're seeing kids that were in junior high, high school, and now they're competing oh, at yeah. the national finals, yeah. and they've been with you this whole time. Oh, yeah, like Kincaid, Kincaid Henry and Haley Williams and several numerous others. But, yes, they've been with us the whole time and, and create that uh, Prefer Junior Elite team. But, uh, you know, that, that whole deal to get it started and what we were doing – was we didn't necessarily want the best rodeo kids, the best athletes. We were looking for good leaders that can go into the industry anywhere. It doesn't matter where they're at, what they're doing. They could be selling boots. They could be selling feed or whatever right. in the future. But they would be those type of kids and just to get, give them a helping hand in, in growth. Well, Dakota, obviously we see you're, you're loaded up with sponsors. And, I mean, it. I could remember when you first started, and I had the pleasure of rodeoing with you and getting to ride your great horse, Rusty. And, you know, you have a lot of the same sponsors you started with. And I think, to me, that just goes to show that your dedication to the product that you're endorsing and the relationship you have is, is important at, from a young age all the way up to the career you had now. Yeah, you know, I've been blessed to have great sponsors along the way, but I uh, I also made sure I went after what I thought was the top at the time. Granted, it was kind of tough when starting out, you know, when you when you go to Preford or you go to Classic Equine, but when you know they're the best, like that's uh, and you can get with them at an early age. Um, to me, just building that relationship along the years, you know, is uh, is worth everything, and we become great friends, you know, and. I remember, I don't know, it was maybe last year or the year before, Prefer posted a picture of, like, your guys' facility oh, yeah. from where it started, and that's worth a Google there. Yeah. But, like, from where Prefer started to where it is now, it's like, that picture is like, wow, that's, that's a champion in my mind. You know, whether it's in the arena or a champion business uh, man is amazing, you know, and that's, I guess, also with my wife's business, Rodeo Quincy, I see what she work, how hard she works and what she's trying to build that business into so I have so much respect for you guys and, and can't thank you as a well, sponsor. Thank you very much. It's an honor. Appreciate it. So you talk about family. Eddie, let's get a little history lesson because, like okay. I said, you guys could Google this, but to have Eddie explain it, I, and you've told me about it, it's, it's, it's pretty cool to see what your granddad what, and then what you guys have taken on and carried yeah. on the tradition. Or... Yeah, so I'm, I'm third generation. So my grandfather started the business in 1964. So he moved from Nebraska down to northeast Texas and Bought 40 head of high-headed crossbred Brahma cattle and uh, didn't have a, he didn't grow up roping and riding and dragging and doing things that you do in Texas. So he went to his garage and built him a machine, which is a head gate, to just work his cattle. And a neighbor saw it, and another neighbor saw it, and it just went from there. He started his own business building cattle handling equipment, going to the veterinarians within 20 miles to 150 miles, selling to veterinarians. And uh, that's what started the business. And uh, today I'm third generation, which in most cases, statistically, that's where most businesses fail, is third generation. Right. Oh, <laughs> so <laughs> pressure's on. Pressure is on, Pressure Eddie. is on, yeah, yeah. So that's how it all started, and we just, uh, me and my brothers, uh, grew up in the business and working from the ground ground up in, on, the, on the concrete floor and working with, our parent, with my dad and yeah. working with my grandfather and that's how it started. So when you guys, I read in, in high school, you'd come home and, and work in the yeah. factory or the shop there. How many employees at that point was there, just you when, and your brothers? Well, when I started, let's see, I'm, uh, I'll be 50 this year. When I started, I was uh, 13. Get off the school bus and go up there and just sweep the floors. And, and my grandfather would have us going through buckets of nuts and bolts, and we'd be sorting nuts and bolts and stuff. So back then, I think there was around uh, 35 employees. Wow. Yeah. Back when I was going in, and how many employees are you guys now? Uh, right at a thousand, like, like nine hundred and eighty. And that's and we've talked for and finding people that want to work is still oh, still it's very tough, difficult, right? Very difficult. Yes, yeah, very difficult to find enough people that want to come in and because it's hot and it's dirty and and everything, but uh, it's work and it's work. Yeah, most most of them want to go young young youngsters. So we're we're. We're trying to teach people how to work, and at the same time, uh, because we can't get enough skilled labor, we're doing a lot more automation than we used to. Right. We've got robots going. You know, I think in the last uh, two years, we've put in about 25 different robots. Oh, wow. And well, robots to handling robots and some automation and some handling. Yep. That's, that's nuts. And, and so for a lot of you folks out there, you see Preford in the arena, you see Preford on the ranch. 
I didn't even realize that you guys bring in steel and roll all your own steel yep. for for everything, and, and to me, that's just amazing in itself. Yeah, yeah, we'll bring in. Uh, yeah, there'll be uh, sixty thousand pound master coals of steel rolled up like a round bell of hay, so it looks like a round bell of hay about that size. So we'll bring in on rail and bring them inside the building, and we'll unload uh, somewhere around two hundred rail cars a month, which equates wow. to about eight hundred truckloads when you do the math in the pounds. Per month, so you got that coming in and going out. That's a lot of steel, and and I got a flatbed put on my truck when, when we moved to Texas. Mm-hmm. I'm in Texas now. Yeah. I still haven't been over there to, to see uh, there in Mount Pleasant. I'm going to make it one day, but uh, <laughs> I got a flatbed put on my truck, and it said, uh, well, I can't remember exactly, but Prefert Steel. So, yeah. I mean, it, you guys build it for, you, you roll it for whoever, whatever. So, so, a lot of people don't realize just in the last uh, 10, 15 years, we've kind of uh, spread ourselves out a little bit. So, uh, one-third of our business is ranch equipment. Everything that you see at the farm stores, from rodeo equipment to the to just the handling equipment for cattle and horses and everything, that's 30% of our business. Two-thirds of our business is selling steel to other manufacturers. So we process the steel for other manufacturers. So you see CM truck beds, Big Tex traders, Diamond Seed traders, all the trailer manufacturers, uh, a lot of different people that manufacture all over the Dallas, Fort Worth, Oklahoma area. So two-thirds of our business is processing steel for others. Well, what's neat about that is, like you said, your brothers are involved, your dad was involved. It's family, yeah. family-ran business. And, That's right. And Dakota, like you guys, you're talking about steel wrestling, but you got Quincy, Rodeo Quincy, and all her line. <laughs> That's that's all family involvement right there. That's making this making this train go down the tracks. Yeah, you know I'm I'm lucky to have a wife that works that hard and uh, and puts up with me uh, and my two kids. But uh, you know to see the hard work that she does, I mean it it also brings a lot of joy to all of us. You know when you see all of her products throughout the um, you know the rodeo or her her bags going around the trade show, but. It uh yeah it helps me get down the road you know just because it's uh to have her you know and her support with the kids it's uh it takes a team out here you know and it's no different like with Lindsay with her boutique and stuff I mean it it takes a lot and a lot takes a lot of great sponsors and a lot of a lot of family you know I mean it was pretty neat to see that slack performance uh, the other morning how filled up it was and I think that was the majority family right there. Right, and to to see that and still have that electricity that morning shows you what a family rodeo is. Well, let's talk rodeo. Um, coming into the eighth go round, we haven't got a go round win yet, no. but you are tied for the average right now. Uh, obviously, two time average champion here, so you know how to get it done on ten head. We were talking earlier. You get a couple more go round wins, get that average win. You're right in the thick of the world championship race. Yeah, Luke. You know it's been. Uh, it's one of those deals I, I never say I come down here to win the average, uh, and now I'm in that spot again, you know. But it's like uh, I've been here 10 years. I've rode it long enough. That gold buckle is what I'm going for. And so the next three rounds, I'm going to try to get those round wins. And like you said, I mean, between the 90,000 I can win the next three nights and the 78,000 the average, uh, you can jump up quite a few spots. So um, that's – I mean, yeah, it's make or break. You know, it might might cost me, but at the same time, I don't ever want to look back and say, man. Um, no regrets. Yeah, no regrets. And it's like, you, that's what, I mean, I also do this to make a living, but at the same time is, you yeah, can't bullshit nobody. Everybody wants to go buckle. <laughs> <laughs> that, that you, true words have never been spoken yeah. right there. <laughs> uh, well, walk us through the first uh, seven go-rounds. Um, you know, you got some money kind of working your way up there and, and winning, but obviously not as much as you want. So let's start at go round number one. Yeah, you know, go round one, I think I placed uh, fifth, fifth or sixth. Um, I didn't get that horse punched off there quite as sharp as I wanted. Um, kind of had too much hold in the corner, probably for the first three rounds. And so I was just missing the barrier, making great runs. Like probably the, the first three rounds, I made the best three runs. You know, all the steers hit flat. And uh, the fourth round, I finally kind of relaxed and just – a calm reaction's faster than the tense one, I realized, and uh, and got that horse punched off there. And the steer was kind of full. I didn't kind of caught him straight, rolled him down his back. There was a steer wag. I knew wag made a heck of a run on that steer. But, uh, you know, I felt like I dropped the ball a little bit. Fifth round, same deal. Got that horse punched off there. Made an okay run. Last night, um, I, uh, you know, that was a great steer. And I... I got a good start, but kind of got broke in. So then when a guy gets broke in, that steer stays straight and takes me a minute to get past him. 
and that just cost me, you know, uh, Bridger won the round on that steer. So it's like, I've had some, I can't say, you know, I mean, everybody come, sometimes comes up to you and it's like, oh, you need to go on the better end of them. And, you know, that is the case some nights, but I'm not afraid I drop that to tell everybody that I dropped the ball last night. You know, if I'd have broke that horse a little wider, got by him a little faster, I should have been, been right up there with everybody else. Well, and I know you, obviously your great horse, Rusty, it's, uh, it was easy. It was, it was like stealing <laughs> on Rusty. And, and not that, uh, you know, Curtis's horse is, is hard, but when you have that connection, because you high school rodeoed on Rusty, you headed on him, then we steer wrestled on I mean, just that connection where you know every movement, every it, just how he feels, it makes a big difference than just having to go jump on something that you don't maybe know as well. Yeah, you know, Rusty, he spoiled both me and you. Uh, and... Yeah, looking back, it was like, man, it was so easy down here. And like I said, not that Tyson's not. I just got to do a little better job riding, breaking him certain spots. Rusty, heck, you could break him right at the pin, and he'd realize that Steer was going to step left before he did, and there you go. You know, it was like, uh, I, I remember, I forget who it was. Somebody said, well, where do I need to break him? I'm like, I, it doesn't matter. Just get on and nod your head. Like, he's going to go where the cow's going to go. And uh, – and that Tyson's as easy as they get. Like you said, I just I need to do my job a little better and give him the um, the best chance he can. Um, and I mean, that's Rusty. I rode him I think seven years out here, and he was great. I ended up getting off him the tenth round in 2019 and rode bins for one and won the round, you know. And then I rode bins and uh, just been blessed to ride some great horses, but they are different, you know. And it just goes back to Rusty how it's like, man. That heart was uh, worth a lot and that grit. Yeah, and the start's so fast. I know a lot of people talk, and I'm going to bring you in on this, Eddie, here in a second, but <laughs> they talk about the gate man maybe, you know, missing the gate or not going fast enough. And, you know, poor, poor Tony Amaral, I'm going to throw his name out there if anybody <laughs> wants to send yeah. him a message. But, uh, you know, it's so fast. You have to be moving when you nod. And it's, I mean, there's a reaction time with the gate man. And Prefert has tried to do the best they can to eliminate all that i can remember you guys changed that latch a oh, few different yeah, times numerous times we can change it many times just to make sure that everything was correct everything was the same it always stayed consistent as much as possible and it would just help and you guys help do all that well and i think the one thing i love about you guys is feedback you're always welcome to feedback and oh, yeah. and uh, you know hey can we change this can you work on this and you know, that's something that you guys have always reached yep. out, especially the ambassadors, because yep. we're the ones that are using using it, using it the most. Yep. Um, and, and mentioning Tony, Tony's even helped with that. Tony, yeah. From, from your feedback to your feedback to everyone's feedback. And I'll just Thanks. always trying to make it better. And I know it's always made me happy to see my sponsors at every rodeo I show up to and see them in the arena. And, and it makes me feel proud to be part of, yep. part of that. But obviously... You seeing it in the Thomas and Mac, that has to be a proud oh, feeling is. for you guys. Oh, it's an honor, absolute honor. Just, just to, just to be able to build the equipment and have it here, and just to, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's fantastic actually, just to have it and use it. Here on the Luke Branquino Show, we like to throw a little rodeo trivia around. So we're gonna ask the question, and you guys put the answers in the comments. See if you get it right. In the team roping event, what is the primary objective? Two men out in the arena doing what to hear the answer you're gonna have to stay tuned keep watching the show because i will answer it a little bit later well it's not even here it's the wcra's oh. used pretty for the pbrs and I, I mean these are <clears throat> this this stuff gets packed around nationwide on the back of flatbeds and gets hauled to every major rodeo event i mean it does and it, it like i said i mean you can't say it any other way it's just an honor to be able to build it for this sport and the people that you get to do business with and be around and, and work with every day. And it's, you know, that's every business. It's about the people. Well, and even when I went down to Australia to do some clinics, yeah. you know, you, you don't think of it nation or uh, worldwide, but you guys are, you guys have your, yeah. you know, footprint in a lot of different countries as yeah, well. Yeah, uh, quite a few, uh, 26 different countries by the time it's all said and done. So we, we ship all over the world, all over the nation and Canada and Mexico, of course, and, well, and I think Tamworth down in Australia has a huge horse complex. You guys sent, what, over almost 600 stalls? Oh, yeah. Or yeah. more now? Yeah, I think it's uh, closer to 1,000 to 1,200 stalls there at Tamworth now. So, yes, uh, and rodeo arenas, buck and shoots, everything. Well, it was good because the very first time I went to Australia, they needed some help in their, their shoot 
But I'm not going to get into that. It was, uh, you know, everything homemade. But obviously, that's how you guys started. That, that's how we got started. Yep. And same, same for them. Both you guys are, I I'm, I'm, should say this, I know he is, and I know you guys are big hunters. Um, Dakota, let's talk about that hunt you went on. With, that was pretty cool, the, the, the little deer. Oh, the coos deer. The coos deer yeah. hunt, yes. Well, yeah. it tell, was it Hunt Wars? Hunt Wars, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was a, that was a heck of a time. Um, if you guys haven't heard of Hunt Wars, go check them out. It's, uh, so we got Mason Clements, uh, Casey Fields versus uh, Mitch Pollock and myself, and we uh, went down to Mexico. And anyways, it goes off of uh, the age of the deer, and then you go off your total net score and uh, what else? The age of the deer, net score and um oh shot yardage so they wanted you to the closer the shot you wouldn't get any more points but anything over 300 yards you're gonna get deducted get deducted get deducted so what they didn't want i mean granted i'm into the long range hunting and and i love it but at the same time that's also why i bow hunt to get close you know right and and it's great like i said the long range deal but it takes practice and skill and i think a lot of guys um you know, I, I don't think they practice as much as they should to be shooting distances like that. So I did admire them to have the aspect of the closer you got, the more points you got, or you didn't get deducted. So anyways, um, yeah, so we went to Mexico, and uh, the coos deer, they're super tough to, to find. I think I sent you yeah. that video, and that little buck that I shot, um, he was walking, and the next thing you know, he bedded down in some tall brush. It wasn't even brush. It was just grass and just disappeared, and they call him the gray ghost. And... Um, Anyway, so Mitch stayed over there and kept an eye on him, and um, me and the camera guy went over there and shot him. And um, harvested, you harvested, harvested. Yeah, I'm not afraid. You harvest, harvest you harvest wheat. <laughs> uh, we're at the NFR. They've heard kill before, right? Uh, sorry. Oh, you're good. Keep it going. <laughs> Actually, Flint posted that one time on one of my comments. He's like, "You didn't harvest that." <laughs> he said, "You harvest wheat." Right. But anyway, so that's where I got that as Flint. But um, well, Flint's not that funny. But yeah. Anyway. True. Um, but anyway, so yeah, me and Mason, we did, or me and Mitch did pretty well. Um, Casey and Mason, they had hell. <laughs> Were they you guys, just, uh, not can, very good hunters probably, they, right? I, well, I don't know. wouldn't say they're not bad hunters. They just might need practice their shooting a little more. Oh, they couldn't hit Oh yeah, them. they, uh, yeah, good thing. Uh, <laughs> That's Casey Field and Mitch Pollock, right? No, Casey and Casey, Mason. And Mason Clements. Yeah. yeah Casey yeah. Field and Mace, Mason Clements are not very good shots. From Dakota Elder. Well, well, I just think they might have been a little nervous. Oh, yeah, nerves will get you. They, I can they, see Casey getting nervous. He doesn't win very much. He doesn't know how to hunt. Yeah, that's right. Hey, but after the fact of this case, he was already trying to line something else. He's like, you know, I mean, he's, he's not used to losing. And yeah, oh, so yeah. he's like, we we need to try to get, we need to set this up. We're going to go deer hunting somewhere else, blah, blah. And I'm like, I'm in. I'm like, we'll rematch. But uh, no, it was a lot of fun. We shot some coyotes, shot some javelina. And me and Mitch both got a good buck. Um, and Mason, Casey, they, they just had heck. It was just one of those deals where well, I think one buck they might have wounded and then um, another buck they couldn't find. But um, it, it was a lot of fun, and that's something rodeoing all year long. You know, it's uh, being around people and being in, in the truck, and you're ready to get out and experience the outdoors. Well, I know Quincy did say to my wife, Lindsay, that – that we should go on a hunt together and they can go shopping. Yeah, that would be, I think yeah. that's, uh, Eddie, you want to, yeah, I mean, we'll send Randall I mean, with, yeah, you well, guys go shopping. Yeah, my wife likes to hunt as much as oh. I do, so. Okay, you come with us yeah. then. Yeah, perfect, <laughs> perfect. So, yeah, hunting on, uh, you guys done it your whole lives. Yeah, all our life, all our life. We hunt a lot on our ranch. We own a ranch there, do a lot of white tilling, pig, pig hunting, but we do a lot of long range shooting. So we set up a range there on, on, our, ranch, on our ranch and shoot about 1,200 yards. Oh, wow. Yeah. We have a great time, but I don't get to, you know, I've worked for a living now, so I don't get to hunt near as much as I used to. <laughs> no vacate. You, but you're the boss. Well, yeah. Head, gen, think. head janitorial. I don't even head know what that guy is. Yeah. Head of janitorial, janitorial. <laughs> yeah. toilet I'm, paper yeah. stacking. Yeah. If I'm not doing real work, I'm sweeping the floors. Or, but I also, you know, I got I bet five, some I days got, you might yeah. want to just go sweep the floor. Yeah, I do. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> just go get on a tractor. Yeah. would be nice. Somebody else worry about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, but I got five kids now. They like to hunt, so I'm chasing them. They're rodeoing and everything, so I'm chasing them around. So I don't get much time to hunt anymore. How old, how old are the kids? Oh, so 22, 20, 17, 15, and 6. And you got one that wants to be a bulldogger, right, because we've talked oh, about Oh, he this. keeps talking about it, but he hasn't got involved yet. I just got to take him to your house. And yeah, <laughs> bring him down. Yeah, take him to your house, drop him off. He'll come back a bulldogger. <laughs> 
Well, All right. Well, he'll come back a bulldog. My kid started bulldogging, my 14-year-old, and I thought, you know, this would be easy. I'll teach him how to steer wrestle, but apparently I'm an idiot. <laughs> I don't know anything <laughs> about steer wrestling. Uh, no, I'm just joking. He, it is funny, though. I take him to Justin Schaefer's, lives right there in Heiko with us, and um, I rode here with Justin last year. I went, and I'll try to tell my oldest, Kate, I'm like, okay, well, maybe try to do this and that, and I get this. Okay. Been there. Yeah, I've Justin tells him the same exact thing. He's like, oh, yes, sir. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I'm like, <laughs> wait a second. I just, I literally just said the same thing. So I'm, it's just right. normal. It's normal. Completely normal. I, I have the same problems with all of them. They won't listen to me either. <laughs> and Dakota, how old are your kids? Because you're going to be experiencing this now. Yeah, I got a three-year-old and a one-and-a-half-year-old. So, yeah, and they're girls. But so. both girls are going to yeah. be wrapped around your finger, right? I hope so. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy how um, your kids that... I, and I'm sure it'll change. Like your older boys are probably a little more, you know, taking what you say a little more seriously. And sometimes, sometimes. yeah, sometimes. they're still boneheads. Yeah, they're still <laughs> yeah, they're 22. They're still boneheads. I guess so. I still do that to my dad, and I'm 43. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you do. I've been around you when you did it. <laughs> well, I don't know what the hell he's even talking about. <laughs> but the the hunt side, I grew up growing up hunting too. Um, my dad taught me so much, and I got to take the two older boys. Well, all three of us went to Idaho this year. And I got to take them, but one, and I'm sure you've got to experience this, but one of the greatest joys I've had as a, as a parent was we spotted a buck and I let those two go at him, let them oh, hunt him. And I got to sit back and kind of watch through the spot and scope. And it was neat because I could see a little, a smaller buck come up and around him. And that buck came in within 10 feet of him. And to hear them tell the story afterwards, <laughs> yeah. it was just like the best thing that oh, yeah, could happen stuff. in the world. But the oldest, Cade, my oldest, took Jameson in. They got in on this buck. Buck spooked, jumped. They had to go after him. But they ended up getting him. And that was, as a parent, one of the coolest things that I got to experience. Oh, yeah, for sure. Yeah. You know, that's some of the funnest things. I've Some of my greatest memories with all my kids is sitting in the deer stands and hanging out and, and just spending time, spending yeah. time with them. Yep. Do you guys archery hunt too or just mainly yeah, ride? Well, I used to. I haven't in the last couple of years. My boys do. They'll all go sit in a tree and try to shoot a white tail with a, with s- a bow. Are you scared of heights so? though? No, me? No. No, I just, I don't have time anymore. I don't have <laughs> time. Go, I, don't, time. Yeah, I don't go do it. Dakota, big archery hunter? Yeah. Um, yeah, I love archery hunting. It just, uh, I mean, I love archery or long range. It's, uh, I mean, I've tried hunting with a muzzleloader a couple of years ago and it's like, if I'm going to get within, in Nevada, you can't hunt with scopes, the muzzleloaders. So it's like, and if you still got to get in with like 100, 200 yards for me. And I'm like, well, if I'm going to get that close, I might as well get, you know, 50 yards with a bow, you know, or just shoot him long range. But it is, uh, yeah, the archery, it makes you such a better hunter. Like, you got to play agree. the wind so much. Like, it's, uh, it's fun. I didn't do any archery hunting this year. I had my bull tag in Nevada that I shot was a, a rifle tag. Um, so it's fun to go back and forth, but uh, there's nothing better than when you arrow something with a bow just because it's, you know, they're that much closer, and you that's how they used to do it. Granted, now the compounds are a lot, I mean, a lot better. Most, I think every elk I've shot's been at 70 yards, one shot, right. but, which is not really, I guess I'd be saying I'm not a very good hunter, but I'm a good shot with a bow. <laughs> but, um, so, I, I mean, that's not really something to brag on, but I, I, I do anything I get into, uh, I practice a lot and it's no not different than you, you know, like when I know when you say you're going hunting up there, it's like, you got a winning mindset and you're going to practice. That's whatever you do. And you usually send me, well, you sent me that picture of that little baby last year you shot, but he was tender. Yeah, I bet he was. He Veal. tasted better than that big one. Like that big 383 yeah. inch bull I killed this that year was pretty impressive, but oh, I did, did send that. I sent my picture to somebody you, uh, you sent your picture too, and they're like, "Wow, that bull's even bi- your bull's bigger than Luke Branquino's." I'm like, yeah, they must "I'm be like, blind. well, that was a good picture because <laughs> mine was about 50 inches smaller than yours." It, but there is something to be said about the archery hunting, and for me, getting that close to a yes. wild animal that is bugling and just going crazy. This year was it was nuts. We we went out and um, we were in the middle. I want to say, and this is this is no bullshit. 25 bulls that were fighting over like a herd of six cows. Wow. And we were, we were within 10 yards to 50 yards of every bull. Like they'd come up, they'd 
wind us or whatever, but they didn't care. It was prime rut. They would look at us, kind of jump away, and then they'd go back to fighting again. But to be in the middle of that and have, like, the hair on the back of your neck stands up yeah. when they start screaming that close to you. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a crazy feeling, you know, but that's, uh, that's part of hunting, you know. And then just going back to, like, when you're talking about with your boys, you know, like, I remember taking Cade and Jameson, we'd go down to the BB guns and shoot those dove down there. Uh, when we go to Luke's, um, when he was in California, you know, and we'd come back up and we'd have to cook them and everything. And oh, so yeah. me and big Jake and all the boys down at the bunkhouse down there, we'd cook some dove for the boy, for your boys. And, you know, that's, that's part of hunting is, is eating it too, you know, and, and that's something I like and it's, it's healthy, you know, it's kind of crazy the, how this world's come full circle, you know, now everybody wants grass fed beef or grass fed. It's like, well, Heck, go put in for a tag and get a grass-fed deer or elk, you know. Which, I mean, <laughs> granted, the beef feels great. It's going to be great for the ranchers. I think there's a lot of opportunity there for, for farmers and ranchers to do that. And it's like you don't have the work of feeding them up or anything. If they just want grass-fed all natural, there you go. Go get it in right. the field, you know. So I, it's kind of crazy how the world Those people think it's cruel. Yeah, but then they want organic this and organic that. And it's like, well, there's that's your organic source right, right there, you know. So, um and it's something about when you when you do harvest it um, and take it back to the table, you know, you get a connection with that. And I actually called you the other day to give you shit about We're getting uh, some in depth. You yeah. have connection with the animal you yeah. harvest. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I know. <laughs> and I did. I was going to call you the other day, but then you said, "Oh, Lindsay's calling me. I got to go." Um, but I was going to tell you, I didn't really miss you, but I missed that uh, beef jerky you used to bring to the finals every year. Yeah, yeah the deer or the, the deer, deer jerky. Yeah. yeah. Jameson made some from the buck he shot in um, in With the Idaho. Susie Q's on it? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Susie Q's. They're yeah. going to become a sponsor. The, speaking of that, if you enjoy the show, please check out uh, episodes we have done in the past on YouTube. Go like and subscribe. And if you subscribe, I have a chance to make money, and I really like to make money since I don't make money still wrestling anymore. <laughs> Anyways, Eddie Preford and Dakota Eldridge guests on the show today. Uh, guys, thank you again for coming on. Eddie... Yeah. I know it's family business, but your brothers, they're also involved they are. um, pretty heavily with, with the business. They are, yes. They are. All, all three of us are uh, heavily involved with the business, and then all of our kids are too. So all my boys work at the plant when they get out of school. So it, it, it's, it's all a family-owned, family-run, and we all enjoy being around each other. So in, obviously you're the president, and what are like your brother's job titles? I know you got the, what, the horse farm and the hunting, yeah. the, the cattle ranch side the of it. The cattle ranch side, but they're both VPs. So yeah. one of them's in the steel side of the business. The other one's in the, in the manufacturing part of it, so it takes care of all manufacturing. And I'm just the, I'm the, I'm the president. and The face. Just, well, I just do whatever I need to do when I need to do it. Sweeping floor, like yeah, Coach said, sweeping <laughs> floors. Yeah. And I know with my brothers, there's always a little bit of you get some brotherly. Yeah, you know, there's there's always that. Yeah, right? every we all you know we we all get along really well when everybody does what I say. So <laughs> we're all good. <laughs> oh, that's great, Dakota. You and your sister probably the same way. She everything was good when you when she oh, did yeah. what you wanted, right? Yep, exactly. Yeah, yeah. If she listens to me, yeah, everything's all good. If I don't tap too much, I can uh, usually get her aggravated pretty pretty easily. If I do a little too much finger tapping or toe tapping, it can uh, aggravate her. I want to go back to Rusty. Um, that was a horse that your granddad raised, right? Yep. So, I mean, this is a story that's been out there, but tell us about his rise to stardom from, you know, when your granddad started him. Yeah, my grandpa raised him, and my dad, I remember as a kid, he's, he got that horse as a two-year-old, I think, and um, he called, he wanted him as a colt. My grandpa thought he had an ugly head or something. My grandpa was a pretty harsh critic to my dad. So I, I like that horse. And so anyways, dad got him and we got, he got him started and um, started team roping on him. And uh, I remember as a kid, I, dad would have me go cowboy on him during the day before he'd be rode down that night before he'd take him to the jackpot. So um, anyways, yeah, so we team roped on him and then, I, and he always was saying, this, this is going to be a, heck of a steer on horse you know and um anyway so my senior year it was sophomore senior year um my other bulldog horse kind of got crippled and was getting old and so dad said let's run him by let's see what he does and we had a little indoor barn um down the road there at barton's house and um the healing box was right on the on the right wall like there was not a real box it was just a wall and so uh dad said well running by so i run him by a couple and I uh, 
He said, well, you want to jump this one? I'm like, well, you're going to haze in that cold? He's like, you don't need a hazer. He's like, the wall's right there. Just run him over there and jump him. And Sounds dangerous. I'm like, okay, you know. So sure enough, I score the steer out there. The steer just kind of eases off over the right there. And I jump him. And then I think I jumped two steers that day. And that was rusty. I mean, he was he was that good. And, you know, through high school, like, I mean, I love team roping and calf rope. When I bulldogged, I didn't really know. My dad was a great bulldog. He won the state four times in a row um, in high school rodeo, but he couldn't teach it. He's like, just grab him by the horns and tip him over, you know? It's like, well, there's more to it than that. I don't can't do that. <laughs> so I didn't ever really, like, learn, learn how to. So I just would grab him by the horns, tip him over. So I never had that big of a passion for it, you know? Uh, so I would heal on him to keep him in shape, like, I didn't like bulldog and that much. And I just was, well, I'll just heal on him. So anyways, uh, yeah, make the high school finals on him. Wink went third, the high school finals on him and then make the college finals on him. And then I'd team rope on him a little bit. Still we'd head on him. Uh, my dad won a trailer on him. I want a trailer on him heading. And then, uh, Greenfield the one year, yeah. he, uh, he called me up for the circuit finals and I'd made the circuit finals in the team roping and my old horse team roping horse kind of crippled. And I, I said, well, I'm going to head on, head on him. He's like, you're what? I'm like, I'm going to head on him, but you can bulldog on him. I said, done it all the amateur radios all summer. So he's yeah, like. Yeah, so it switched saddles yeah. between events. Mm-hmm. So we, uh, so Sean, he's like, well, you could tell he was a little like hesitant. <laughs> he's like, let me, let me call you back. So a couple of days later, he's like, you, th- you think you work? I'm like, well, I know he's worked. I've done it, you know? And uh, I said, if you, it's no, no big deal to me. So sure enough, yeah, it was, they, Bulldogged and then team rope right back to back there at the Columbia River Circuit Finals that year. And yeah, we I put a rope tie down on him and I told Greenfield, I said, I don't, usually don't use spurs, but I said, go ahead and use spurs. And I just put his little bulldog and bit and leather tie down on him. He wins the first round and then uh, me and Garrett placed another round. And then, yeah, then it was a couple years later I realized and kind, kind of got to around Knowles and around um, Car Nine and stuff and a lot of good bulldoggers up there in the Northwest and, um, and got to learn more about steer wrestling and realize that I could have a career at doing it, you know? And so then that's kind of when I developed a passion for it. And, uh, and I've, I've learned so much along the way, you know, coming down to your house and stuff and, and, uh, and been grateful to travel with, you know, winners like you, I got in the rig with Blake Knowles and, and a couple guys early on Stern Lambert and Clayton Morrison and, and to be in a, a good group of guys right there from the beginning, and they knew I had a good horse, but at the same time, I still got a lot out of them. And then, um, I uh, yeah, you kind of took me under your wing, I, main, mainly for my horse, but uh, but no, you were a lot of help. <laughs> and uh, anyways, yeah. So then it was yeah, seven years. I think the other day somebody asked me. I think it was seven years I rode him down here, which is pretty amazing. Yeah, you know, I didn't mount really, that yeah. horse a lot, but and I, and I know a lot of guys they probably still cuss me for that, but. It was one of those deals that I, I knew I was young and had a, had a heck of a career ahead of me. And it was like, so I tried helping out the guys that I needed to, you know. And, uh, but yeah, I hated telling guys no, but at the same time, it's like that horse is part of the family, you know. Right. And it was how I made a living. I knew, and at the time, I didn't have a great haze horse. I was never smart enough to go buy a great haze horse, but I was smart enough to hire out to one of the, to get the best hazers. Uh, I look back, I'm like, damn, I could have made a lot of money off you if I had got 20 per percent. But, yeah, yeah. Um, but even that 12, it wasn't like so for me to get 12 and a half percent off of letting Joe Blow ride, it, you know, it wasn't that 25 percent makes a, you know, to me, it's a little more, I mean, I guess whether I'm greedy or whatever, but it's like more money makes, in your pocket. Yeah, more, it's worth it. You know, if something does happen, you guys get crippled. So, anyways, yeah, I guess there, so seven years in the national finals, you won the gold buckle. And uh, did you win the average that year, too, on him? Or, I did, yeah. Yeah, I so did. yeah, uh, gold buckle, three average titles, and um, yeah, we just met my little daughter's riding him now, though. So that's pretty impressive. And you know, we talk about the brotherhood of rodeo, and and Eddie, I can't get you off this stage without talking about our brotherhood, uh, the best Maverick class in the Rancheros Visadores history. Yep. Maverick class 2020. I um, agree 100. percent Yeah, I mean, <laughs> it's just the, but the brotherhood we have there on yep. with that class, but just as the organization. You know, it, it's it's pretty special. It's very special. And it, it, like I said earlier, it's just like a family reunion. When we get out here, we get to see everybody and say hello. And, and, and like you said, the best class 
Ever. Ever, yeah. And But the gr- crazy thing is it's guys from all walks of life. All walks. And it doesn't matter if you're a billionaire or don't have a penny in your pocket. Right. When you guys get out there on that Vistadores ride, it is, you're the same. You're the same. We all have a great time. And it's, we're all the same. You know, all the same. And just met some of the finest people I've ever met in my life. Right. And, and yep. you have people all the way from, you know, Walt Disney to Ronald Reagan to Cowboys, just ranch yep. hands. Yep. And when they get out there, they're, it's just one big family. And, uh, you know, obviously getting to know you a lot better through that organization. Absolutely. Um, it, it's, been, it's been an honor to be a part of it. And, again, we're going to say it, and we'll keep saying it, the best Maverick, Maverick class, class in the history <laughs> of the Rancheros Vistadores. So 4Q all the way. 4Q all the way. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, guys, I really appreciate you guys coming on the show. Dakota, three rounds left, a lot of money. Um, you know, stay after them. Remember, what, we're going to hit the barrier. We got to hit, hit the, the barrier. barrier. Yeah, that's – when you – we're going back to that when, when Luke was talking about the start, how fast it is. It's not like I like hearing you say, oh, he's behind the barrier again tonight. <laughs> oh, if he could get a little closer to the barrier. I do not – that's how fast the start is. It's not like – guys trying to see something it's just hard that hard to get that start you know it you know and uh anyway so i just giving you shit for that well i just feel like a broken record so if you'd hit the barrier a little bit more i said wow you hit the barrier (laughs) made a heck of a run i did make your hazer mad though eddie i told i said something about uh well curtis is in third place again (laughs) but you know what in the olympics they give medals to third so he gets a bronze at least you didn't at least you didn't say cody should be down here doing it well i did say that at calgary didn't (laughs) i Well, guys, thank you. I appreciate you coming on, Eddie. It's always a pleasure to yes, visit with you, but more so these young competitors see those yellow bucking shoots. They know that it is Prefort Steel that they're, uh, they're wanting to get to at this National Finals Rodeo. Thank you all for joining us on the Luke Branquino Show. Please like and subscribe on YouTube. Again, I'm retired. I don't make money steer us anymore, and it is a way for me to provide to my family. So think about that every time you want to hit that subscribe button. Thank you all for joining me. Come back here tomorrow, 1030 to 1130 here at the Las Vegas Convention Center on the Cowboy Channel stage. Rodeo trivia question. In the team roping event, what is the primary objective? Two men out in the arena doing what? The primary objective in team roping is for one, the header to rope the steers around the head, half head or neck, and the healer to heal the back hind legs. One foot is assessed a five second penalty.